Good afternoon and welcome to Good Gardens. This is a joint presentation between the Seniors Association of St. Margaret's Bay, the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club, and Transition Bay. Today we have two interesting speakers for you. Karen Llewellyn from the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club and Robert Savelli from Transition Bay. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information about both of our speakers. Karen Llewellyn has been enjoying growing food and flowers at her home in St. Margaret's Bay with her partner for the last 30 years. A self-taught gardener, she loves experimenting with different varieties of plant and trying new methods for growing, especially when it comes to her veggie garden. She has developed quite a love for container growing and has discovered that many plants are well suited to this fun and easy growing method. Karen's presentation today will cover selecting containers and matching their sizes to plant material, soil mixes, plant choices, location concerns, advantages of container growing, design and novelty container ideas, and much more. When she's not in her garden, Karen has worked as a licensed psychotherapist for the past 23 years largely online these days. She and her partner also tend a flock of very friendly chickens and share their home with four cats and a rescue dog. Karen is an executive member of the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club and a member of the Red Roof Artist Group and the Peggy's Cove Area Festival of the Arts. She has presented for Transition Bay on backyard chicken keeping and led workshops on seed starting for the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club and on holiday decorating for Christmas in the Bay. Robert Cervelli is the Executive Director for the Center for Local Prosperity, a charitable non-profit organization working with communities across Atlantic Canada to relocalize rural economies and build climate readiness. Robert has been active in community building for over 35 years. He is co-founder and chair of Transition Bay, St. Margaret's Bay, one of the first transition initiatives in the Maritimes. He manages a teaching center micro farm at his home at the head of St. Margaret's Bay as part of a web TV series entitled Transition Garden. Robert has also been a life science tech startup entrepreneur for over 25 years and understands the issues related to new business creation and the health of resilient local economies. His presentation today focuses on how we can plan, grow, harvest and preserve high yield vegetable gardens on our own properties with limited space and only a modest effort. Robert suggests the Victory Garden model of World Wars I and II is an excellent concept for us all to embrace today as we look for ways to increase food security for ourselves and our communities. The Seniors Association of St. Margaret's Bay thanks the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club and Transition Bay St. Margaret's for their partnership in today's video presentation. At the end of today's talks, David Wimberly will share information and links to help us learn more about food security. If you have questions, comments, or photos of your own gardens you'd like to share with the Bay Seniors, please email center at bayseniors.ca or post a comment on the Bay Seniors Facebook page or send a private message by Facebook. Questions will be answered on the Bay Seniors Facebook page and in future issues of the Bay Seniors Newsletter. And now, here's Karen. I am doing a container gardening presentation today because why? Because I love growing things in containers. And over the years, I've discovered that you can pretty much grow anything you want in a container. I moved to St. Margaret's Bay 
about 30 years ago. And my partner and I, we started out with, you know, traditional, very small in-ground vegetable gardens with a little neat rows and little mulched paths. And we had a few perennial borders and did the typical, you know, shrubs and, you know, ornamental trees. And of course I had my pots of pansies and pots of geraniums and all those things on the deck. And over the years, I began experimenting to see what I could grow in different containers and found different unusual kinds of things that I thought might be kind of fun to try growing in and discovered that basically you can grow just about anything in a container if you follow certain basic principles. And as you can see in this presentation, growing in containers offers you a huge variety of choice when it comes to plants, you're able to provide conditions that suit individual plants in a way that you cannot do in a main garden. You can attend to the needs of individual plants because they are in small containers just for them or their companions. You can protect plants when necessary from bad weather. You can move them around, you can cover them, you can bring them indoors, you can overwinter things, you can grow things in our climate that we're not able to grow because you can protect them. So as long as you keep the needs of what you're planting in mind, you can basically grow whatever you like. Planting in containers is fun, it's easy to do, just about anything can be, you know, can be transformed into a container. Beyond the aesthetics, though, what you need to look for is containers that you can convert properly. So what do you need to do? Drainage. That's probably the key. Soil is your next key and size. Those are the three things that you need to keep in mind. Anything like I say can be converted. In this slide you can see a galvanized wash tub. Um, obviously you need to drill holes in the bottom of that to provide the drainage, but what a stunning little planter it makes. You can see there's a couple of wagons, an old child's wagon, and a little tiny one. No doubt they've drilled holes and made drainage and turned them into really cute little containers. And then lots of the typical ones. All shapes and sizes, everything to choose from. What you wanna look for is matching the size to what you're growing. For example, if you were growing cactus or succulents, something that's very shallow rooted, a dish shaped container, something kind of wider, not so deep is, is very very good if you're growing something like a tomato that has very deep roots you're going to need a very large you know sort of gallon sized pot to to put it in so match the size to what you're growing and keep in mind what the mature size of the plants is going to be um, also the material some materials like plastic and steel heat up very quick like the galvanized tub they're going to heat up really quickly plants that love a lot of heat like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers are gonna do well in, in those pots. Uh, ceramic and clay pots, very um, you know, typical choices for herbs. Uh, lots of people like them, they're good looking, there's lots of varieties, lots of styles. They drain really well, they keep roots cool, they have a lot of air exchange, they're permeable, oxygen can, can, uh, can like the, the plants can breathe, the roots can breathe, so they're very good choices. Um, and then the last thing, basically, is personal taste. What do you like the look of? In this slide, someone has taken wooden boxes, turned them into little container gardens. We've got beautiful urns beside the door. You can see that the, the concrete urns, kind of the, the gray, they've matched the foliage and the plants, and it's very, very stunning display. So you can, you can always, you can group pots for lots of interest. Uh, plant like the big urns or big special specimen planters. You can do um, just about anything and achieve whatever kind of look that you're going for, whether it's informal, formal, you can have lots of fun with them, as long as you mind the basics. So we have already talked about drainage. The other thing that's very important with plants is the potting medium that you're using. You can purchase a really good potting mix. Um, you know, that, that you can purchase potting mixes that are, you know, for seedlings, for transplants, and for containers. They, um, there are many manufacturers, hardware stores, grocery stores, nurseries, they all sell a good quality mix. Or you can make your own. And I do have recipes on the next two slides, which don't feel you need to copy them down because all of this presentation is recorded. You can go to the site later. Uh, scroll through quickly to the the slide that you want and screenshot it or write it down so you know don't don't worry about copying down the recipes 
Um, basically, when you're planting up your container, start in the center. You want to fill your pot almost full of soil. Start in the center, gently putting your plants in, tucking them in, work your ways out, fill in all the gaps with soil. If you have a granular fertilizer that you're mixing in, do it before you plant. If you're adding one on top, do it after you've got everything tucked in. Once you have your um, plants in, you want to plant them at pretty much the level they were growing. And by the time you're finished, you'd like the soil and the pot to be within an inch or so of the top so you can get good air circulation in your plants, especially um, for things that you're planting quite uh, closely and intensively. You want as much air as possible. And then uh, put them where they're going to get the light that they require, water well, and that'll water the roots in and help them make good contact with the soil. And that's all you need, no matter what you're growing. This is uh, just a little note about the, the mixes. Um, basically, if you're making your own soil mix, you're going to be using things like sphagnum moss, coconut fiber, coir, perlite, vermiculite, and compost. All of those are your kind of your basic ingredients. In terms of recipes for homemade soil, on this slide, anyone who's interested can come back. There are recipes for making soil for seed starting, for transplanting, for flowers, tropicals, and vegetables, and also a DIY container fertilizer blend that you can mix for yourself. And the next slide has some specialty soil recipes for houseplants, potted trees and shrubs, and for succulents and cactus using basically the, the original recipe and then adding the different other things to it to make the medium more suitable for the plants that you're growing. You'll notice um, none of these use soil. They all use different ingredients to make a soilless mix. And that's what's mean, what they mean on the bags also when you buy a soilless mix. So that's what you're looking for. They're usually sterilized. If you make your own, it's also sterilized. It's very healthy. You're not gonna be introducing anything to your plants that you don't want. So those are the basics that basically um, you follow no matter what you're planting, whether you're designing containers for flowers, for herbs, or for vegetables. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was designing flower containers. Um, these obviously are purely for aesthetics. Um, uh, they're for enjoyment. They're nothing too terribly functional about them, except they make us feel good. And they make us, they make us have nice thoughts when we go outside. Most flower arrangements are designed around a principle called thrillers, spillers, and fillers, which I just like saying. But anyway, all that means basically is that you have usually a tall specimen plant somewhere in the pot. That's your thriller. Around it, you put in a bunch of other little fun little plants that complement that one. Those are your fillers. And in this photograph, the canna lily, canna lily is obviously the thriller. The little coral, I think those, I think that might be bacopa. That's your filler. And then the spillers are the purple flowers that are spilling over the edges. Very stunning arrangement, very typical. Here's another slide with lots of examples of that standard design. The one feature plant surrounded by complementary companions. It's the most common type of design for floral displays and the one probably the most used and the one we're all probably the most familiar with. And very stunning. Um, you can do small ones, but these containers are often very large because they really make a visual, stunning kind of visual statement. Here are some examples of planting your floral containers with mainly fillers. You'll notice there's no feature plant. In this design style, Plants are chosen usually one or two, sometimes more, but usually only a couple, either complementary colors or textures. They're planted together. And what you're trying to do is create like a drift or almost a cloud of color um, as it fills out. Nothing that's planted is gonna to spill too far over the sides so that you can put it on a surface or on a table, unlike the next one. Oh, no, sorry, not the next one. <laughs> this next one is actually my succulents planted in a, a little container in that basically that filler style. I'm hoping over time the succulents fill in the whole space and create kind of a little cloud of just fun little textures and colors. So that's the fillers. And then the final style that we're all familiar with is the hanging baskets or the mainly spillers. 
These don't usually have a feature in them. They usually are just the trailing plants, sometimes fillers on the top as well. They spill over the sides, usually trailing down so far that they need to be hung or put up on a pedestal. And uh, again, the most common thing probably that we get for our hanging baskets up here. So those are basically the main styles of um, planting when it comes to making floral arrangements. And you will notice something different with floral arrangements that I will be pointing out with herbs and vegetable containers. When you're planting floral arrangements, you usually plant them very intensively. If I was planting vegetables, I would never put that many in one pot because they wouldn't ever amount to much. But when you're, use, you're doing flowers, if you have good soil to start with, and you fertilize properly for the flowers, you can plant very intensely and have a really good visual show very quickly. If you planted a floral container the way you planted vegetables, you'd be waiting most of the summer for it to fill in. So this is the one exception to spacing when you're, when you're planting, uh, planting your, your, thing, your flor flowers. I have some suggestions for flower containers. This is by no means extensive or exclusive, but these are flowers that I have used for ourselves and for uh, my partner's gardening clients in doing pots. I've got some suggestions of accents, fillers and spillers for both sun and shade. And these are kind of tried and true in our climate and they work very well. And then lots of fun pictures of different combinations. Lots of, uh, again, lots of the main thriller spillers and fillers in the mix, but lots of other ones too. So I'm going to leave flowers and go into herbs, growing herbs and containers. And this is probably the most common way that we grow herbs in our climate. Um, most culinary herbs are from hot Mediterranean type areas or warm regions of the world and they are not meant for our climate and they will not overwinter here, so they do need protection. I've got a rosemary plant in a pot that I've had going for about five years and I bring it into to our house every, every winter. And we have a sunroom um, and I just mist it and, and keep it as happy as I can and hope it makes it through and so far so good. But if you have your herbs in pots, you can bring them back in the house. You can move them. If it's inclement weather, you can you know, basically treat them um, in a way that you can make them uh, live on. With, um, you'll notice in a lot of the pictures that I'm going to show you with them, um, with herbs, that they are planted in clay pots and ceramics, very common for herbs. Um, the clay pots keep the roots uh, nice and warm. They drain really well. Um, the, the temperature extremes are not huge in clay and ceramic. Um, not quite as hot as in a plastic pot. The, um, you'll notice here lots of different uh, attractive plantings of herbs in the clay pots. I really like the, um, the look of the three pots stacked. You're making kind of an herb tower with one pot inside the next, inside the next. And uh, I think it's just a really effective way of, of growing herbs. Down the bottom corner, there's um, a shot with many, many different size clay pots and individual herbs planted in each one. It just, it looks really pretty. It's very inviting. Put it on your deck near your kitchen, use them, have little herbs on your windowsill. I mean, it's just, it's the pretty, it's the best way. It, best way to use um, to use herbs to grow herbs and um, you'll also notice that a lot of herbs are being grown in in the clay pots it's probably where they're happiest and now for the big one growing veggies growing veggies is probably the more complicated of all container growing and probably the one that everybody's most interested in right now um, most um, most growers are breeding varieties of vegetables, especially for container growing these days. The demand is growing for people. People are wanting to grow some food, even if they have limited spaces and containers allow them to do that. Food insecurity is a real concern for many of us. And a lot of us are starting to believe that we need to really look at where our food is coming from and at how it is produced. In the last few months, We've all realized that things can change very quickly and that if we're not able to produce a lot of what we need, we will have no guarantees of supply as we move forward.
There's a lot more interest in growing vegetables in general these days, and now that's even heightened. Not everybody has the space, but containers will allow people, even with the smallest of outdoor space, to grow some food for themselves. And during these days, with so much uncertainty, doing what you can to have a little food security is probably a really good thing. Most vegetables do require about six hours of light, uh, sunlight a day, although that um, some vegetables can grow with a lot less. Um, if you have limited light, I believe the afternoon light is, no, morning light is better. Um, but if you can get, if you can move your pots around and get at least six hours of light a day, that's good. Some vegetables though actually benefit from a little shade in the summer, like greens and brassicas, lettuces. So um, even if you don't have a lot of light, you can always look at growing those. Okay, planting your vegetables. Some people say, should you use seeds? Should you use transplants? Obviously, with herbs, other than basil, you're gonna be using transplants for the most part, because most of the perennial herbs take so long to, to actually you know, grow and, and become any size. With flowers, probably you're buying flowers or you're growing and putting your transplants in. But with vegetables, a lot more choice. Some vegetables do not do well when they're transplanted. Things like um, beets, carrots, other root vegetables prefer to be direct seeded. So you want to put the seeds in the container where they're going to uh, grow on, not have to move them at all. Peas and beans are also usually directly seeded. I tend to soak mine first and allow them to sprout and then plant them in my containers. That way they have a, you know, I'm a little more guaranteed of germination, obviously, and of them growing on. Um, things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants that usually have a really long growing period, they're usually started as transplants and then planted in. But many vegetables can be direct seeded or transplanted. It's up to you. You can do whichever. Greens, spinaches, lettuces, brassicas, cucumbers, squashes, all of those vegetables can be seeded this time of year directly in the pots where they're going to grow or can be put in pots in June when the weather stabilizes a bit and put out in pots as transplants. If you are seeding, Good rule of thumb, uh, although follow directions on the seed package, obviously, but if you don't have access to that, a good rule of thumb is putting your seeds about two and a half times their width deep. Um, and if you do that, you'll probably be okay. Advantages of growing. Uh, advantages of growing veggies in containers. Tons. As we've already mentioned with containers of flowers and herbs, you can basically uh, control the, the nutrients, the fertilizing a lot more easily. You don't have a whole bunch of different things. You usually have one or two or three or four maybe in a pot with similar needs and you can fertilize them and take care of them to the best of, of what they need. It's also easier to find insect infestations if you're looking in a pot than if you're looking in a big garden. You can just kind of check your pots. They're usually up higher. They're at, you know, more at your waist level or, you know, it's just easier to work with pots. Um, insect infestations are not usually as bad. Things like slugs and cutworms don't tend to crawl into containers or at least not as much as they do if, the, if your plants are in the ground. Um, Containers can be moved, as we said, they can be protected, given more sun, less sun, moved out of horrible weather, put them under cover if there's going to be frost. The other thing is there's far less problem with weeds. When um, plants are planted in a garden, as I'll talk about later, weeds can creep in. When they're in pots, the weeds can't creep in. So unless something blows in, you don't usually have a lot of problem with weeds. The only thing that is a little more, um, a little more problematic with containers is watering. When your vegetables are in the ground, they don't need to be watered as often. When they're in containers, you're usually checking them for water every day. And that's probably the most important thing is to remember to water. The nice thing with containers, when you're planting flowers, for example, you're planting groups of flowers together to get a particular effect with color and texture and blooms. Sometimes when you're planting vegetables together, 
and you're employing a, a principle called companion planting, you're doing so to benefit the plant in other ways. Sometimes it's for visual. It's very pretty sometimes to see, um, see things growing together and you know one color complements the other, the same as with flowers. But the other thing you can do with growing vegetables, sometimes you plant companions specifically for a purpose, like you might have a container with um, carrots growing on your deck and you might plant a few onion bulbs in that, in that container. The smell of the onions um, throws off the carrot root maggot and, or the carrot rust fly and they can't find the carrots to attack them. So the companion is actually doing the carrots a favor. Um, sometimes people will um, plant a container with a big tomato and while they're waiting for the tomato to come to size, they might plant some greens or lettuces in the pot with the tomato. The tomato shades the lettuce, does lettuce a favor, and by the time the tomato needs the space, the lettuce is harvested and the tomato gets the pot back. So those are just a couple of examples of, of ways that plants can be planted together to benefit each other. Some plants also grow with companion plants that actually benefit their growth, like tomatoes planted with borage, the herb. The herb is, is said to actually, um, I don't know if it's a chemical reaction in the soil, but it's said to enhance the growth of tomatoes. And there are many, many examples of that online that you can find where growing vegetables with each other actually benefits the, the vegetables involved. This is a slide, uh, just some suggested sizes for planting um, and pot sizes. In general, plants like tomatoes and zucchini need fairly large containers to reach their mature size. Peppers, beans, beets, they can all do well in about a 12 inch pot. And lettuce, spinach, kales, chard can actually do quite well in a pot as small as eight inches. Things like chives, onions, um, radishes need surprisingly small space, four inches four inches of, of depth and you can grow those. So really, if you have a container, you can probably find something that will fit in it. Um, these are suggested sizes. Again, you can come back and look at the slide later and get the information. But as the, the title shows, they can, they can be grown even in smaller sizes. If you have good soil, if you fertilize properly and offer all the right conditions, things can be planted very intensively. you just want to make sure that you are growing things in enough space that they have uh, enough space for the roots to grow in this slide you can see the um the big container we've got two big cherry tomatoes with their cages and in the front there's a little squash plant kind of draping out which will probably trail along the patio and enjoy the heat from the concrete obviously that's a lot of plants in one container but with good soil and fertilizer those will all grow to maturity you can see there's actually tomatoes on there right now. Just to show you can, you know, you don't need a big garden to grow a tomato. Here we've got carrots growing in a galvanized tub and a sugar pot watermelon. I mentioned that a lot of breeders are growing vegetables specifically for container growing now because there's such a demand. That's one example of that sugar pot watermelon. Container that I would like to talk about a little bit touch on is fabric grow bags. These are becoming very popular. They're widely available in a variety of sizes. People are using them primarily for vegetable growing and herbs. They are very permeable. They drain well. They're said to, um, in, they're said to uh, be healthier for plant roots because of access to oxygen. Not being a scientist, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I'll take their word for it. What I know is that they do drain very well. They are very long lasting. You can use them season after season, easy to store, not heavy. And if you're trying to move plants around to maximize conditions, you don't really, and you have big, you know, container of vegetables like a big tomato plant or something. You, you know, the extra weight of the pot is a factor. So the fabric grow bags are great for growing um, like large, kind of big things of vegetables and stuff, and and very easy to move around and and deal with. They do dry out quickly. You do need to keep an eye on the water um, because they are so permeable. But really good choice for growing and good choice for balcony growing. They don't add a lot of extra weight if you're 
in town and department or something like that. I have used the fabric grow bags for potatoes and I actually prefer growing my potatoes in bags, boxes and barrels. I don't think it's, it's been quite a few years since I've grown a potato in the ground. Um, as I get older, I am trying to find ways to not work quite so hard and digging a row of potatoes is, is a lot of work these days, especially since they like clay soil. Um, but with the bags or barrels or boxes, whatever you want to grow them in, you just, unlike other vegetables you're planting, when you're planting potatoes, just put a bit of soil in the bottom of your container, put your spuds on top with the eyes facing up, cover them with soil about an inch or two. And then when the sprouts start coming up, every two or three weeks, when the sprouts are up, maybe, you know, maybe about like half a foot or more, fill in more soil until you get the soil all the way up to the top of the bag. And it might take three or four sessions of putting more in because you don't want to overwhelm the vines each time. Um, the vines will continue to grow on out of the bag. It'll look nice. You water it, take care of it, just like any other container. When the vines start to die back, all you have to do is tip the bag over, dump everything out, and pick up your potatoes. No digging required. It's the best way, absolute best way to grow potatoes. And the potatoes actually do quite well. Here's a picture of lemon balm, an herb in a, a big fabric grow bag, looking very healthy, very lush. They, they really are a good, uh, a good choice if you're looking for good, easy, sustainable kind of containers for vegetables. A little more utilitarian, a little less decorative, but they get the job done. And again, they're easy to store. So if space is an issue for growing and space is an issue for storing, good choice. Now, I can't really talk about container gardening without talking about very large container gardening, which is my favorite thing, raised bed gardening. This is our backyard. It's nothing much in there right now. It's, you know, it's coming. It still feels like winter out there, but the um, few years back, I started converting all my in-ground vegetable gardens to raised beds boxes, which in my mind are just very large containers. They still have all the advantages of the smaller containers. The, you know, the weeds can't creep in because there's a barrier. Um, slugs and cutworms, not as much an issue. Nutritional needs, much easier to meet in a confined space. Sorry? Oh, I think, okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so the, um, the raised beds, what I do like about them, it, unlike the, the, well, a couple of things, as I've gotten older, I enjoy being able to work at uh, sort of at sitting level and not having to get down on the ground. My, my body doesn't want to do that anymore. I also like the fact that with the raised boxes, just like tending the containers on a deck or anywhere else, you can sit down beside them, you can work. It's very easy on your body. It's very enjoyable. It's a nice way to garden. And because you don't ever walk on the soil and you don't need to dig it, you don't compact it, you don't um, interfere with the soil structure because you're not digging every year when you're growing or every time you're putting things in or planting or transplanting, you're adding nutrients, you're adding compost, you're adding things to the soil and building it up as opposed to tearing it down. So it is a good way to garden. And since we're talking about food gardening and container gardening, um, definitely you don't have to go this big, but this is a really good idea. Um, for growing food. Um, you can, uh, when you're building a container, like a raised bed container garden, make sure that your, your width is no more than three or four feet so that you can actually stand on the outside and reach into the middle to tend your plants and then go as long as you want. You could have four by four, you could have three by three, you could have two by two. It's amazing how much food you can grow in a box that's two by two just incredible with good soil and fertilizing you can intensively plant and grow a lot of food. I wanted also to kind of touch on a little bit um, just to get your imagination going on sort of specialty pots and unusual ideas for containers. Here's a picture with a strawberry pot planted out with strawberries and below that is one planted out with what looks like alpines and succulents. Very stunning little display. You got a bicycle with blooms falling out of the basket and an old chair that's been made into a plant stand. I mean, 
can just let your imagination run wild. You know, somebody's hollowed out a log and planted plants. They've got a door in the garden of the window box, really nice visual accent. Here, and more examples of little fairy gardens made of broken pots, an old truck, a bench, wheelbarrow, all converted. And I love the desk. Somebody obviously has drilled some drainage holes in that, but what a great little garden on your deck. I just, I love the idea. I think people are so creative. And when you're container gardening, you can be creative. You can have a lot of fun with it. Here's my little fairy garden. It needs a little bit of work from the winter, but I think I have a few little spots there where I could put some stuff. But again, it's just fun. It's nothing practical about it. It's just for entertainment. And finally, I want to finish with pallet gardens. <laughs> Another kind of container. As I was doing this presentation, I thought, how many kind of containers are there? There's probably many, many more. But I did want to touch on this one, pallet gardens. Um, if you have a deck, you can stand a pallet up on it. There are many examples here of pallets being used for vertical gardening and also horizontal. Somebody has used pallets to make a big tower. They've laid some down, planted in the middle. If you want to convert a pallet garden or a pallet, a wooden pallet into a garden, you can build out the shelves with wood and put pots. You could build out like a planting box with wood behind and make drainage. Or you can use landscape fabric and a staple gun and make planting pockets behind your pallet to put your plants in. It all works. And it could make a really, really pretty visual wall. Um, so yeah, so just hopefully you've gotten a little inspiration, a few ideas from, from some of these. Whatever kind of garden you're dreaming of or whatever plants you've been wanting to try, container gardening could be your answer to creating a beautiful and possibly edible garden wherever you live. So. I really hope that you've gotten a little something out of this and I will be taking questions. But before I do that, um, I am a, a member, as David said, of the St. Margaret's Bay Gardening Club and here doing this presentation kind of on their behalf. And they have so nicely granted me a minute to just tell you a bit about our club. It was founded in the 90s and we are currently 87 members strong. We normally meet uh, every month with guest speakers and presentations. Um, and some of our events uh, that we normally have when we're not in a pandemic are holiday decorating workshop. We do CD Saturday workshop, vendors and demonstrations. We host a community plant sale and a perennial order for the membership, the community plant sales for the community. We also have a, a summer membership picnic. The club designs and maintains the Crossroads Garden. And we also partner with community groups like Transition Bay, St. Margaret's. Bay Seniors and the Community Enterprise Center. We have a website, which is on the slide. Please come and check us out and join us. We, we welcome all new members. It's a very dynamic club. And although the last 14 months, we've had to cancel a number of events, we have stayed connected and we look forward to being able to resume our activity soon. Um, and uh, and we, we've, had some, we've had some really good workshops and really good speakers and presentations. So, please check us out and join us. And that's it for Container Gardening. Thank you very much. A lot of what I'm gonna show you comes from uh, the gardens here, um, but a lot of everywhere else. And we're gonna talk specifically about food resilience, climate victory gardening. And it is coming full circle. The old larder, food stores, a deep pantry, whatever you want to call it, uh, garden, greenhouses, preserves, a lot of different aspects to food resilience and really thinking about local production and really building that pantry, that uh, uh, root cellar uh, and that larder. Um, and so that you've got uh, food when you need it. You've got a uh, not just a week supply, but maybe one or two or three months. Now, why scale up production? I'm assuming everybody has grown a few things, um, even if it's those beans in the backyard or on a deck in the pot. Um, there's always ways to get started. There's always ways to scale um, very creatively, no matter what you've got. 
Um, you're going to get the freshest possible vegetables. You're going to get the highest quality. I mean, at this point, my wife is spoiled. We go to the produce section in the grocery store and we compare like the celery or just about anything else. Tomatoes, forget it, in the grocery store. Um, you get spoiled with your own food because it's so much uh, better tasting, so much higher quality, so much fresher. And the important thing, the old saying is, know who grew your food. So I know who grew my potatoes and my carrots. And sometimes I don't even wash them that really on that well because I'm not worried about what's on them. Um, so I'm very comfortable with my food. I don't question it at all. And of course, uh, we consider the gardens our grocery store. Pick up a basket. And the checkout is when you get to the kitchen. So that's really how it works. And when you look at the value of a large basket of vegetables these days that you come in the gar out of the garden with, if you were to ring those up at a farmer's market, you begin to realize how much money you're saving. And then of course, exercise, satisfaction, being out of doors. Garden therapy is a big one. One of the women that helps us in our gardens. She's thinking of getting a garden therapist certificate from a university out of the US. So it's an actual thing, garden therapist. There you go. So it's real. And no, seriously, they know that any population, if you have them do gardening, they feel better. It could be prisoners, could be a seniors home, could be kids. Everybody just, you know, picks up their spirits and they do a whole lot better. Now, um, a lot of you or some of you may not have a lot of space. There was a very uh, time honored book came out in the 70s, I think, called Square Foot Gardening and took it literally every square foot. Uh, what's going on in that square foot? And there's some garden beds that we have, I really think, okay, what is that square foot doing this month? And you really kind of get it down to that level. So you're thinking about productivity. I'm gonna talk a lot about successional planting um, and it's really then uh, getting the most out of the soil. It can be pushing the soil pretty hard, but if you've got good compost, good ways to rejuvenate the soil, you can get enormous productivity. I think uh, David and I and some others, we run a uh, volunteer uh, vegetable garden for the St. Margaret's Bay Food Bank. Four raised beds. Um, I think it's 120 square feet in total. And one year we produce 600 pounds of vegetables out of 120 square feet. Pretty impressive. So it can be done. You don't need a whole lot of space. Then there's um, one of the big things we try to do is, is to convince people to convert lawn, particularly in suburbs, where there's a heck of a lot of grass, a heck of a lot of money gets spent on grass, how to convert that quickly and easily to a garden. So um, we've got what's called the 45 minute Insta garden, where you start with your grass at the bottom, you go dumpster diving, get a bunch of cardboard, lay that down on right on top of the grass. You bring in a load of good garden soil or compost, dump that right on top of the cardboard, spread it out, put in your transplants, and voila, you've got a 45 minute Insta garden, which is how long this one took uh, in a subdivision close by where we live here. It went in so fast, I, we showed up at, I think it was eight o'clock in the morning. We were done before nine, transplanted and everything. And the neighbor walks out, looked over and couldn't believe what happened. Like, where did that come from? So it's entirely possible, it's easy. And it's a great way, if you've got a garden, a great way to expand it for next year as well. So there's also community gardens. Um, I'd mentioned the, uh, the one where we, it's a volunteer effort to grow food for the food bank. That's what's going on in this photo. 
big crowd showed up for the final harvest. Uh, there's, I know, at least one community garden in Halifax that's going to be brand new in the spring. They're having a, I think yesterday they had a big planning meeting for it in the Clayton Park area. Uh, there's more and more of these community efforts popping up all the time, which is really a great way to go because people can learn from each other, which is very valuable. And learning is always happening, no matter how long you've been a gardener, no matter how long you've been a farmer, you're always continuing to learn and you get a little bit better every year. So to talk a little bit about the growing season, um, typically, traditionally, we think it starts at Victoria Day weekend and it ends at Labor Day weekend. That's what most people think. You get past the frost danger and you wind up before the fall frost danger. But it's really possible to stretch it out. The spring season can be very productive. One of my favorites is the fall season now, September, October, November, and even right into December. I've got a lot of stuff coming on right now. Um, but the question is, how do you extend those seasons? Uh, and you need some equipment. You need to think of the choice of equipment and the choice of plants. And I'm a big one on infrastructure, particularly over the next three to five years. Um, think about infrastructure, um, more space, um, more season extenders, um, more gardening implements, whatever it takes. Um, I think those always pay off. So uh, there's a lot of different season extenders and I'll go through these very quickly. Um, grow lights, uh, cloches, cold frames, row covers, tunnels, greenhouses. Uh, grow lights for us starts in probably mid-February where we put in our ultra hot chilies, get those going right away. Uh, they're very finicky. They need high light, high humidity. They need 80 degrees Fahrenheit to germinate. Uh, so we really baby them along. Um, there's some tricks to learn about grow lights. Most of the time, the light's not strong enough. You can see the uh, plants at the bottom are getting just a tiny bit leggy. Um, that's where they stretch out their stem, uh, which can uh, make them weak. So that's a sign of uh, the grow lights not being strong enough or close enough to the plants. So there are a few tricks like that, uh, but it's a great way to get early starters for uh, tomatoes, peppers, number of other things. The clochets, this is, I think, um, from somewhere, uh, this is in Great Britain, uh, probably uh, this is in uh, somewhere during the war, uh, not sure which war, might have been World War I, big glass bells uh, that they were using to grow lettuce early in the season. I mean, that's an amazing field right there uh, and the effort that it would take. Modern ones um, are easy to do just save all those big jugs. Do have a ventilation hole at the top. Um, it's really important if you've got a young plant, that extra amount of heat that you can give it for the first couple of weeks, particularly in the spring, particularly if you live in a maritime climate where you're getting a lot of that cold ocean air coming in all the time, that extra heat really pays back big time later in the season. Uh, tomatoes, for example, the more of a boost you can give them with heat in uh, May and June, the, that's going to just translate into many more tomatoes that you get in August and September. Uh, so these can be really important. Uh, they don't need to be expensive or fancy. On the left there is one of those big, uh, I think it was an industrial light uh, fixture. Uh, it's just a big plastic dome uh, that's used as well. Uh, then row covers um, are also very good, mostly to protect from late frosts in the spring and early frosts in the fall. Um, very easy to use. They come in different weights, uh, thicknesses of fabric. Most garden centers uh, and even hardware stores will sell them to you. Um, very versatile, important to have. They can also be used a lot for uh, keeping pests at bay of different kinds. Uh, then basically a bigger row cover with a frame is a season extender like a tunnel. 
it can be plastic, it could be a row cover. Um, but again, if it's plastic, you have to think about ventilation. Um, but you can uh, really build up the heat in there. It's something where you would lift the sides uh, and then get down in there and work as you need to and then drop the sides back down. Uh, if they're plastic, you really have to think about wind protection because wind can pull them off uh, quite easily, particularly in our part of the world. Cold frames, another very common one. Um, just about any window will do. Um, on the picture on the right was a group of us building cold frames a number of years ago. So I think we first got the windows, we had a lot of lumber, and we made the frames the size of the windows so that everything fit together very nicely. Just like with the clochets and the uh, row covers, you do have to think about ventilation. I like to keep mine kind of porous with holes or gaps around there so I don't have to worry about things overheating. If a cold frame is closed up tight and it's a sunny day, things are gonna tend to cook in there. So it's always good to keep them a little bit loose and a little bit of a gap. And here's an innovative one. Uh, somebody even went further and used bales of straw to insulate a cold frame. And it looks like they've got just a plastic cover where they can pull down uh, and use that for um, um, opening and closing uh, to get in and out of there and so on. Uh, there's all kinds of various things I've seen along the way. Uh, the one on the left, uh, it's called a hot frame. And what they did is they first dug a ditch, they threw in raw horse manure, which heats up very quickly, about, a, about uh, maybe eight, 10 inches of raw horse manure. Then they put six inches of soil over the top of that and they planted vegetables and that manure as it's breaking down heats everything up and it will tend to heat up the whole cold frame. Um, that was a trick I think originally developed in France probably a hundred years ago. Greenhouses, take your pick, just about every size and shape you can think of. I started my gar gardening career with what I called hippie greenhouses. I, pull together a few odd two by fours and other scrap lumber, build a frame against the side of a house, cover it in plastic, funky little door to get in. You probably had to bend over most of the time because you know it was only maybe four feet high, uh, but I could grow some fantastic stuff in there. And it probably cost 10, 20, 30 bucks to build the whole thing. So that's one extreme. All the way up, you could buy a very fancy Lord and Burnham glass, you know, filigree, wrought iron, et cetera, kind of greenhouse at the other end of the spectrum and everything in between. Um, we like the, the dome, geodesic dome type there. It's freestanding, easy to build. Uh, David and I both have one. Uh, there's the poly tunnels, which are very, common and they could be sized just about any width and length imaginable. A lot of them go to 100 or even 120 feet for the bigger commercial operations. Then this is a very innovative one. This is a repurposed Canadian Tire car shelter. Okay, you can get them at Canadian Tire. They're probably on sale even as we speak. All right, and you throw out the, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, vinyl covering. And in this case, they rebuilt the end, put a gable end on there with a door and covered the whole thing in plastic and beautiful greenhouse, just like that. So it's a really nice frame. Rule number one, two, and three in greenhouses is anchoring, anchoring, and anchoring you don't want your greenhouse to turn into a kite. And they do, and it ain't pretty. <laughs> so you gotta really anchor them into the ground. Neighbors had a beautiful 20 by 24 foot plastic poly, big storm. Somehow the doors blew open, wind got inside, lifted the whole thing up and slammed it against the house. So it happens. 
Um, so you really got to make sure they're well anchored. Um, when you get into the spring season, um, it's there's a lot of really cold hardy crops that you can plant even in March in a cold frame. Um, I usually get my cold frames going in early March. I give it a couple of weeks for the soil to warm up and then I start planting radishes, spinach, some early lettuce. I really like spring turnips. It's a short turnaround crop. There's a lot of other stuff you can plant directly in the ground. Uh, peas, cilantro, arugula, broccoli, kale, a whole lot of cold hardy crops like that. You can start to seed early a lot of your summer crops like the beets, carrots, parsnips, rutabaga, potato. Um, some of the things, squash, zucchini, cucumbers, we start indoors in pots uh, in late March and start to put those out in May. Uh, and then of course your summer transplants as things start to warm up. So this is potatoes growing, going into a nice long row. We got a good harvest out of these this year, uh, two different kinds of potatoes. And I think we planted those in mid-April uh, sometime. Um, so a lot of stuff and uh, you can learn along the way. You probably already know some of them. Uh, spinach is one of my favorites. Uh, it's got to be one of the co most cold hardy crops I know and I'll, I'll return to that. Um, seasonal uh, bed turnover is a big one. We think of some beds, um, an early spring crop. Um, uh, well, one example, we did radishes in one bed, which I think of as a, like a five week crop. It's in and out um, between, uh, let's say late March through April into early May. All of the radishes come out. We turn the bed over with new compost, et cetera. And then we're ready for summer crops. And uh, in this case, the, sum, the that bed, the summer crops came out and we're now just finishing a batch of uh, radicchio that we transplanted in there. And it held up to seven below uh, a couple of nights ago quite well. Uh, the summer season, of course, um, this is the main production season. A lot of stuff takes all summer long, like cabbage, for example, and Brussels and and so on. But during the summer, it's important again to start thinking about successional planting. Think about what are you going to grow in the fall. Start thinking about it in July because there are certain windows that you're going to miss if you want good fall crops. Um, so uh, some things like carrots, fall carrots by the mid to late July is kind of your window your last window to get fall carrots in. They take a while to germinate. Uh, there's a number of other things like that. Uh, we like to plant a fall crop of broccoli and it needs to get seeded about the same time into transplant trays. So in the summer though, uh, things are cooking along. This is our big greenhouse with the tomatoes and they get way up over your head. Um, and a lot of good production. This is what some of the, uh, I think those are probably early cascade there coming on. They haven't started yet to ripen. Uh, we also like to do the big beef steaks. Um, there's nothing like that summer meal where you've got a perfectly ripe beef steak tomato and you slice it really thick and you put on the olive oil and the balsamic vinegar, crumble on some feta cheese and wow. Um, so you get those really nice seasonal treats and look forward to those um, every year. This is the other uh, smaller greenhouse where we, uh, starting in March, do a lot of seedling transplant production and seed trays, and then it converts over to a summer hothouse. Uh, a lot of chilies, and along the uh, north wall, uh, it's all cherry tomatoes, usually two or three different kinds, so we do get a lot of cherry tomatoes. Uh, uh, produced in that greenhouse as well. And again, another uh, example of successional planting. So uh, we harvested uh, this bed. We had seed trays ready of lettuce and fall broccoli. And that, in, after we refreshed the soil, 
that immediately went in uh, to start another crop. Comes back to that square foot planting idea and what's every square foot doing this month and really trying to get as much productivity out as you can out of uh, each bed that you've got in your garden. Uh, the fall season, uh, a lot of bok choy that we're harvesting right now. It stands up very well to late frosts and even, even freezing. Um, spinach, I think, is completely bomb-proof uh, when it comes to cold, as far as I can tell. Um, we still have some leaf lettuce out there doing quite well uh, and taut soy. Um, and we just finished planting our last winter spinach about three weeks ago. Um, and that will get its feet in the ground and it'll be coming up strong probably in March, April timeframe. Um, so that fall season tatsoi I mentioned, it's the two pictures on the left. It's this kind of rosette, an oriental entel vegetable. Um, it's literally foolproof like spinach to the cold. There's been uh, Decembers where I have gone out uh, at five o'clock with a headlamp, a snow shovel, a knife, and a basket. And I shovel the snow away because I kind of know where the tot soy is, cut a whole bunch, put it in the basket, and come in, and it looks beautiful. It's amazing. So that's part of that four season gardening. It's out there, you know, protected. Another one is miner's lettuce, Claytonia. Uh, it's very prolific self seeder. Once you get it going somewhere, it'll always kind of be coming back as volunteers everywhere, uh, but it's delicious. Very nice, subtle, good salad green and similarly very, very cold hardy. Again, this is uh, some successional planting. Uh, this is cabbage uh, right in the center there. And then just to the right of that, uh, you can barely see at the far end of the cold frame. It looks like there's probably some arugula coming up uh, in the soil, some seedlings. Uh, so these are uh, fall crops coming in inside of a cold frame where they'll be protected pretty well right through the winter um, once we put the covers on the cold frame. And then on the left there is uh, some newly seeded stuff um, that's going to be protected with row cover. Uh, so that's an example of the types of things you can do in uh, September um, time frame, getting ready for uh, winter crops. Now this is something we do in our big um, unheated uh, greenhouse, 20 by 24 foot. Uh, we start seeding spinach in late August after the tomatoes, peppers, eggplant come out. Um, or early September, right up until probably the end of September, seeding the spinach. And then about six weeks later, you can see what it looks like, maybe eight weeks later, depending on how warm it stays. Um, quite a good crop there. That's when we start picking it. So we've been picking spinach for about two, three weeks now. Uh, and it continues to come on. It's slowing down because the days are getting shorter, getting colder at night. It's slowing down, but it's still growing. It's gonna effectively go dormant in uh, January, um, parts of February, but the days are getting longer. It can tell, it's gonna start getting warmer and it starts to go gangbusters in March and April again. And we're picking a whole lot of spinach. So there's all of this winter harvest. We've got kale that we're gonna put under row cover. It'll carry through most of the winter. Uh, keep the frost or the uh, wind burn off of it. Uh, we still got uh, parsnips, carrots in the ground, a lot of the other cold hardy greens. And then of course we've been preserving and we've got a lot of stuff um, in the root cellar that actually we're gonna talk about. David mentioned uh, there's a root cellar workshop coming up. So kale is, is a great winter crop. I think of it now, it's not really growing much, still a little bit, because we were still having warm days here in November, but it'll just hunker down. We'll put it under row cover where it'll be protected. And all winter long, we'll just go out there, pull back row cover, a um, few feet at a time down the row, cut kale, and we've got winter greens 
um, all winter long that way. And of course, getting out there, as I mentioned in the snow, there's Michelle McPherson, some of you know, with a uh, very nice looking parsnip there. Uh, we just harvested a whole bunch, uh, particularly after a good freeze, they get really, really sweet and quite yummy. Um, and then of course, digging up carrots, potatoes, a lot of other things can be pulled out of the ground. Now that's as long as you don't get a deep frost. So you have to be a little bit careful there. I can tell you one story. I don't want to go too long here and allow some time for discussion. But one time I was, I let all my parsnips stay in the ground. It got really, really cold with no snow cover and the frost went way too deep. Then we had a foot of snow and I decided I was going to go out and dig up some parsnips. So I went out there and the ground's rock hard. So first I had to shovel all the snow away, get to the ground. It's rock hard. So I get a pickaxe busting the soil loose and all the parsnips are coming up in bits and pieces. I <laughs> said, to heck with it. Well, I finally had to just said, all right, no parsnips. We waited until spring when everything thawed and we had way too many parsnips all at once. So you got to be a little careful leaving stuff in the ground. Uh, this is the uh, winter greenhouse. Uh, we pulled one of the covers off. We, we use a row cover on a wire mesh uh, to keep it warm um, with some beautiful crops, tot soy in there, some arugula, some other things. So this is an example, uh, January 15th. It was a minus 11 outside in the middle of the day. It was five degrees inside, and we were able to pick spinach, arugula, oak leaf lettuce, and totsoy in the middle of winter. So it's all possible. This is without electricity or any kind of heating. That's what the basket looked like, made a beautiful salad. And what do you do with all this harvest? Just to wrap up real quick. Um, we're not going to get, I'm not going to get into food preservation. Uh, there's been a lot of other discussion and venues for that, but it strikes me that it comes down to six ways to preserve food, uh, really, uh, that uh, mankind has invented along the way. Uh, one of it is with heat, canning, where you're basically going to kill any microorganisms. Uh, the other one is salting, uh, which keeps things from growing because of high salt level uh, microorganism. There's drying, dehydrating. That's a very effective way to do a whole lot of different things. Uh, fermenting, of course. Uh, there was just a great fermentation workshop a week or so ago. Freezing, and then high sugar levels, jams and jellies, which is similar to salt. You get the uh, concentration high enough and things can't grow in it. So that's really, uh, the other whole side of putting up that food larder and storing enough food. So with that, I want to close with this photograph. This is really cool. This is a drone photo of the subdivision by our house taken in 2040. And you can see what the backyards look like. Everybody's got a full lawn garden in this subdivision. It's just amazing. So yeah, that's a drone photo from the year 2040, incredible. So a sneak peek of the future there. I'd like to thank everyone for watching the presentation on climate victory gardening. Uh, I'd like to show you some additional information uh, that we can provide you, um, some resource material and so on. Firstly, uh, the full talk on Climate Victory Garden is available at this YouTube link here. Uh, you can save it. Uh, we have an additional speaker on that version, Aaron Clements, talking about urban victory gardening, as well as what I presented on suburban and rural victory gardening. Victory gardening is important. It's the future. It's how we need to build resilience uh, and security around food supply. Gardening is an important life skill. And I certainly encourage you to learn as much as you can and also to teach and encourage your children and your grandchildren to do the same so that future generations will have that important skill. 
that's something I think that will be important. But do go to that YouTube link. You can see uh, the full presentation. And um, what I'd also like to provide you with is uh, a little bit of background on who is Transition Bay. We're part of an international global network of transition movements. Uh, it started in 2005 in England, it went viral. There's some 90 transition towns in Canada alone and in other 52 countries around the world. Uh, we work to build resilience at the community level around the fragilities uh, uh, in global networks around um, the effects of climate change, uncertainty um, in energy supply and increased economic fragility. So that's a lot of the projects we do, many of which are food related. Uh, you can see our website here, uh, check out our events listing. Uh, we have a Facebook page as well. Uh, email us at info at transitionbay.ca. And you can ask to be put on the mailing list. We do send out um, newsletters on occasion. It's a great way to keep tabs on what we're doing. And of course, donations are greatly appreciated and you can make those on the website as well. Finally, a little bit about our upcoming events. Um, some of these are not finalized yet, so um, either get on the mailing list or do check the uh, website. On either September 8th or 9th, we're still uh, deciding on those uh, dates. We're having a workshop on medicinal herbs, both uh, growing medicinal herbs and wild harvesting. And then later that month on either the 29th or the 30th, again, still deciding on the final date, we're going to talk about mushrooms, how to grow them, cultivate your own at home, and then how to do wild harvesting in a safe way. On October 14th, there's a workshop just on off-grid cabins, and we'll feature two of those being built right here in the neighborhood. Uh, in November, we're uh, finalizing a date with Michelle McPherson. She's a very well-known beekeeper, and she'll be teaching us the art and skill of beekeeping. That this should be a fantastic workshop. And then finally, December 2nd, rather than going out and buying stuff, this is an opportunity to pick up your skills and uh, let others know as well so that they can learn about how to make a lot of gifts for the holidays this coming year. And finally, I do want to say Transition Bay is 10 years old this year. We've done a huge amount of events, projects, workshops over that time. And we are planning a birthday party of some type. Hoping, of course, that we could have gotten together just like this workshop was planned, uh, but not to be with COVID. So do stay tuned on that. We'll be planning some kind of virtual events uh, later this year. And uh, we hope you can join us for that. So thank you again uh, for uh, watching this presentation and uh, do check us out on the website, join our mailing list and keep tabs on everything that we're doing. Thank you again.